And Father, we we pray for kids camp coming up this weekend, oh, this week. Yeah, starting tomorrow. Lord, we pray that you'd be with all the leaders and volunteers and that you'd give them patience. But Father, we take advantage of every opportunity to share the good news about Jesus with these children. Thank you so much. Father, we pray for this time together here that we'd honor you in what happens. We make sure that we glorify you. Thank you so much. You're such a great God. And I know, I know that we don't worship you enough. We don't fall at your feet enough. And I pray, Father, that we would, that our lives would be about worship, that our lives would be to glorify you in all we do and say. Thank you so much, Lord. You're such a great God. Thank you for everybody that's here this morning. For those who couldn't be here, we pray in Jesus' name, you'd pour out your spirit upon them. You'd give them comfort and peace, whatever it is they're dealing with, whatever it is that's going on. God, be real to them as you're real to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. So we're at John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. You remember John chapter 11? Jesus has just raised Lazarus back from the dead, and, and he's alive again. He was in the tomb for four days. Now he's alive. And, and so now what we see is, is they're going to have a party. They're going to have a party to uh, celebrate Lazarus back to life. So that's what's going on here, John 12, 1 to 11. Six days before the Passover, John always, <laughs> all the way through John, we see it's just about every chapter starts out with, well, a couple of days before the Passover, a couple of days after the Passover, he's always making sure that you know it's around the Passover time. Because Passover is very important. Passover is, is, is one of the most important holidays for, for the Jewish people because it's a time when the angel of death passed over their house, didn't kill their firstborn. Because God promised them, if you put blood of a, of a spotless lamb, you put blood on the doorposts of your house, the angel of death will pass by and not kill your firstborn. And, and so God provided salvation for the people of Israel. And it was just, a, it was, it was a, a, a foretaste. It was a, a foreshadow of what was to come when Christ put his blood on the posts. Salvation for all. Beautiful. Death passes by us because we put our trust in Jesus and the blood that he shed. Fantastic. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Same guy. So they gave a dinner for Jesus there, kind of thanking him. Thanks for bringing back my brother back to life. Martha served. Lazarus was one of those reclining with Jesus at the table. That's how I like to eat. Lay down. How my wife put food in my mouth? <laughs> She's not here today. She couldn't make it. She's at the camp. She's camping out. So they gave a dinner for Jesus there. Martha served. Lazarus was one of those. So there's a whole bunch of people, but Lazarus is there reclining at the table with Jesus. Remember, they were good friends before, eh? Remember, you remember the story? Was anybody here we did chapter 11? One guy? Good. Good. Excellent. It's, it's kind of funny how you can, you can go to, to fellowship on a Sunday and by Monday, you've already forgotten what we talked about, eh? I used to, I used to marvel at that. Like I, was, I was a pastor's kid. I was a, my parents were pastors. And I used to sit in church like it seemed like all the time. I don't think I ever left church. But I don't remember one sermon my dad ever preached. <laughs> Is that bad? I'm sure it's in there somewhere. I don't know. And he was a good preacher. It's not that I fell asleep a lot. Check out that this is the important part here. Mary took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard. It wasn't, it wasn't imitation, it was pure nard. And anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. 
And then there's Judas Iscariot, one of the other disciples. And, and he was about to betray Jesus. This is the guy who gave Jesus the kiss of betrayal. Okay, we're going to get to that. It's pretty exciting times. Why was this ointment, this is what he said, this is what he said to Mary. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He's pretending that he cares about the poor. Judas said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself. He used to be putting his hand in the money bag all the time. Whenever he needed some cash, he'd take the money. So every time the disciples were given money, it was Judas who collected it. He's carrying around the money bag. And the guy's a thief. This is one of Jesus' disciples, man. This is one of the 12. This is a guy who walked with Jesus for three and a half years. He watched Jesus do miracles. He heard Jesus speak incredible, incredible speeches, incredible talks that could only be from God. He, he was there. He witnessed this. And the guy's a stinking thief. Listen, you're going to meet people that have been in church all their life. And then you're going to look at their life and you're going to go, what the heck? Obviously, church didn't help you one bit. There's people pretending. There's people, this is guys, the disciples, one of the 12. Incredible. Jesus said to Judas, he says, leave Mary alone so that she can keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you'll always have with you, but you don't always have me. Jesus is telling them again, I'm leaving, man. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not on account of him, but also to see Lazarus. They, they knew Jesus was there. They wanted to see him and hear what he had to say, but, but they also wanted to see Lazarus because they heard those stories, Lazarus being raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. See, see, Lazarus is going to say, Jesus raised me from the dead. And the chief priests don't want him doing that because that's going to take the focus off of them. And, and so they're planning not just to put Jesus to death, they want to put Lazarus to death too. Because that's what religious leaders do. I don't know if you know, like a lot of people don't know history. And, and, and I'm kind of glad my wife's not here because she hates history. But if you do the history of the Roman Catholic Church, you will see that they put to death many, many people who tried to expose them by putting the word of God into the hands of the, of the common man. So they were, the Bible, the, the Bible that the, uh, that the Roman Catholic Church was using is the Latin Vulgate. It's written in Latin. Nobody speaks Latin except for pharmacists. <laughs> It's true. It's true. And if you want to get on the pharmacist case, pharmacist comes from the word pharmacon, which in it means uh, in the Greek it means witchcraft. I just throwing that out there for you conspiracists. So, <laughs> hey, I buy all my drugs from a pharmacist. I don't care what the word means. When. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, I lost it again. They have, like, it's with my wallet. The Latin. Oh, yeah. So the Bible, the Latin Vulgate is the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church still today. So if you have a problem with what the priest says, the priest will say, well, let's go to the Latin Vulgate. Well, you don't have a clue what it says. So they go, well, what it says here is this. So they win every time. You can't beat a priest. So the Roman Catholic Church has got this Latin Vulgate and people like Tyndale, people like Martin Luther, people are trying to put the Bible into English well, or their, their common language. So Luther would have been German. So they're trying to put it in the common language so that people can have a copy and know what the Bible says, what the Word of God says. Roman Catholic Church don't want it to happen because if it happens, they will be exposed for the lies that they're teaching, lies about purgatory, lies about indulgences, lies about everything. And, and so, so everybody that comes forward as, 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 as that, that they catch, that they capture for, for, for translating the Bible, they take them and they kill them. 
They burn them to death on a post with hay around them. You want to read these stories, man? Fox's Book of Martyrs. I don't know how many times I told you, but y'all should have them by now. Fox's Book of Martyrs. And you read about these guys, these guys who love the Lord and they love the Word of God, and, and they're being burned to death. And they're sitting there, and the Holy Spirit is giving them supernatural strength. And they're being burnt to death. And the eyewitnesses are writing. And they're saying the guy is singing praises to God as the flesh melts from his face. Would you do that? Would you do that so that God's word could go out into the world? There's people today that are dying trying to get the word of God into the hands of people. It's happening today. It hasn't stopped. But people don't ever say that about the Roman God. They don't say, well, look at all the people you killed, you murdered. Because they wanted to print the word of God in, in the common language. Isn't that awful? I'm, by the way, I'm not a Roman Catholic hater. I, 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 I am not happy with the priests. If, if one was standing in front of me, I might slap them. Because <laughs> they're lying to the people. They're, they're leading the people away. And that's what these religious leaders were doing too. They've got their own agenda. Listen, if we expose the Roman Catholic Church for what they are, liars... That, that maybe many people in the Roman Catholic, they wouldn't, but maybe many people in the Roman Catholic Church would turn away and, and then the priest wouldn't get his money. He wouldn't have his nice house and his beautiful buildings and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and so they will do whatever they can to protect the lies of the Roman Catholic belief. That's sad. If you're here this morning and, and you're a Roman Catholic, you just wandered in here, I don't talk this way all the time. A lot of the time I do, but not all the time. <laughs> And you got to understand, my wife is Italian, and I get forced into going to these baptisms and these dead baby dead, I don't know, whatever they do. I, I don't even understand what they're doing, all this voodoo stuff they got going on. I always ask the priests after, and they hate me. And I go to them and say, excuse me, you did this. What, what did you mean by that? When you said that, what were you talking about? Can you show me in the Bible? It's a mystery, my child. <laughs> <laughs> That's what these guys are doing. It's the same thing. This is how religion works. Religion works this way. We lie. We lie in order to get people to follow us, not Jesus. Us. Our system, our institution. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not the way it was from the beginning. In fact, the Catholic Church, not the Roman Catholic Church, the Catholic Church was instituted by the apostles in early days and it was, it was done that way so that we could bring all the teaching together and make sure that people weren't teaching lies. And then, and then like 400 years later after this started, the, 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 the people in charge, the head ponchos, they now call themselves popes. They didn't in the beginning. And, and they started twisting and turning and changing things. And, 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 and now it's all so full of lies, nobody's really quite sure. And that's the same thing that happened with these Jewish leaders. They, listen, Judaism started out fine. There's nothing wrong with Judaism. They were following the Torah, the, the, the Mishnah. They were following all the teachings of the Old Testament. Everything's going along fine. But by the time Jesus arrives on the earth, these, these Jewish uh, priests and leaders, they've twisted and, and changed the word of God into, into all kinds of nonsense. Because they want people not to focus on God, but to focus on them. Maybe you see some people from the Protestant faith on TV doing that. They don't want to point you to Jesus. They want, you to, point, they want to point you to them. It's not about man. It's about Jesus Christ. Amen. We've got to get that right. So the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Did he do anything wrong? Did Lazarus do anything wrong? Why do they want to kill him? Because Jesus raised him from the dead. Can you imagine? Like, it's my fault. I was dead. I was minding my own business. Holy smokes. That doesn't even make any sense. Because on account of Lazarus, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. 
That's his why. <clears throat> if we were, if we were to take a minute and think about the gifts, the gifts that meant most in our lives, the gifts that we got that meant the most. I bet we would discover the most meaningful gifts were personal and sacrificial. When someone, when someone gives you something, if it's a sacrificial gift, you know, I've had people give me stuff. They'll come and say, I, I made this for you. And I know they can hardly afford to make that for me. It's a sacrificial gift. People with lots of money will come and you give me a check. It's not sacrificial. You know, they give you a five dollar check. Sacrificial. When people give you something sacrificial, I wish Pastor George was here because he loves telling the story. When, when, oh, is he here? Oh, Jesus! What are you getting shorter? <laughs> His eyes are getting better. Mine are getting worse. Pastor George loves telling the story on when we lived in Kenya. And, and, and you go visit somebody, they will give you whatever they can give you. And uh, so Pastor George goes into this little hut and he's sitting there talking to the people and they want to give him an egg. So they boil an egg, they fry it, they boil it in the oil so it's really nice and cooked. And then they take it out and they, they plop it in his hand. Yeah, a little warm. <laughs> So, and then you're thinking, well, I got to whip this thing in my mouth or else my hand's going to burn off. But, you know, I whip it in your mouth, you got that skin hanging down. <laughs> but it was sacrificial. That egg, that egg meant a lot to that family. And they sacrificially gave. And that's, that, those are the kind of gifts that stick, stick in your head. You know, it's like when your kid comes to you and, and, and they've made something and you're not really sure what it is, but here, I make this for you. And, and they spent hours doing it. And you don't know what it is. But it was sacrificial. They spent time. They put, they put all their effort in. That's a beautiful gift. When a person gladly sacrifices for our benefit, it shows the depth of his or her love for us. The gift is greater than the materials it's made from. It's, it's a tangible de demonstration of their love. In, in John 12, we find this gift of, of great significance. And Jesus promises this gift will never be forgotten. What this woman has done will never be forgotten. Wherever the good news of Jesus is preached, the story of this gift will be shared. That's a fantastic thing. In a previous chapter, Jesus received a message that a good friend was sick. And because he loved him so much, he took his time showing up. Guy's been dead for four days. Jesus rose him back to life. He brought him back to life. Jesus interrupted the funeral. <laughs> he messed up everything by bringing this guy back to life. But the chapter doesn't end with a big celebration like you'd expect. I mean, Lazarus comes out of the tomb. They take off all the bandages. And there he is. He's alive. And you figure, well, everyone's going to have a big celebration. That's not what happens at all. In fact, it, it, it zooms right in on the, the chief priest having an emergency meeting. How are we going to kill this Jesus? How are we going to take care of this, this Lazarus guy? It's a big meeting. There's no celebration right away. It's six days later now. We're six days later, and now they're having the celebration. I would have had the celebration right away because all the sandwiches are made and everything. Those little ones with the cream cheese on them. <laughs> So good. You know, sometimes they make those, they put peanut butter, and then they put a piece of banana. Yeah? You have those? 30, 40 of those. Oh, yeah. I would have been celebrating right away because all the stuff was ready. The mourners were there. Everybody was there. We have a big party. But they had to wait six days because all the, the chief priests had to have their meeting. And then these guys all get together. The scene that follows the resurrection is not a party, but a secret meeting where the self-righteous religious leaders all gather together and plot how they're going to kill Jesus. He needs to die. Why does he need to die? He's taking away everybody from us. We're losing our attention. We're losing our authority. It's interesting to think that Lazarus is a picture for us who are born-again followers of Jesus. 
Lazarus raises from the dead. He comes up from the dead. And then, and then the next time, the next chapter, we see him reclining at a table, a banqueting table. And this is what, this is what it's going to be like for us who are followers of Jesus. We're going to be dead in our graves. Jesus is going to come back. We're all coming out of the grave. Those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ are going for a banquet. And they're going to have the little round sandwiches. <laughs> Beautiful. That's, that's, what, that's what we're promising in Revelation. There's a big banquet, banquet of the Lamb. Isn't that cool? So this is what's happening here. We're seeing it happen. Death has nothing on us. Death has nothing on us, just like Lazarus. Death cannot hold us in the ground. Jesus has proved it already. He, he brought Lazarus back to life. Jesus proved it already. He died on the cross, and three days later, he came back to life. He's defeated death. There is no death for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll live eternally. Isn't that fantastic? Look at you guys just jumping out of your seats. You're so excited. Man. I was telling somebody, I, I met somebody, I, I think it was at McDonald's. That's... It's a hard place to witness there, you know. People say, is that like Ronald McDonald? I'm telling about Jesus. I'm telling about resurrection life. And I was getting so excited, I spilled my tea. Yeah, yeah. It was terrible. But then I cleaned it all up. And the lady brought me another tea. She must have seen me. She said, oh, there's an old idiot. I'll, I'll help him out. She brought me a new tea. And I said... This is like resurrection life here. I spilled my tea it's back in my cup again. Well, I, was, I got so excited. I, I can't not think about resurrection life and get excited. I have to get excited. Don't you? Listen, if you're having so much fun here on earth that you just, I, I don't want to die. I'm just loving it here. If that's you, you got to check your heart. If you think this is good, oh, you haven't read your Bible. You don't know what resurrection life is like. Oh, it's so exciting. I, I almost have to start talking about that. I shouldn't because that's not in the notes. i got to stick to my notes. What have I got, five minutes? I'm not even six, sure how that clock. Six minutes. <laughs> so what does the 13 mean up there? When there's seven minutes left, you should be wrapping up. Oh, when there's seven minutes? Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, here we go, okay? Now, to the notes. The main focus of this chapter is not Lazarus, but it's the gift that his sister gave, that Sister Mary gives to him, okay? So here's three things. I got three points, and I got, like, no time. The gift itself, okay, number one, the gift itself. The gift is an ointment that was normally used for burial spice. That's why she's anointing him with this nard. It's, it's what you put on the body before death or, or at the time of death. It's the burial spice. She's doing it before death because she knows he's going to die. He promised that. He's leaving. And so she's anointing his body. She's preparing him for burial. The gift, the gift itself, it weighed a Roman pound. That, that converts to between 11 and 12 ounces. That's like a can of Diet Coke. That's all I can relate to. It's equivalent to, oh, 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 it's expensive. It's equivalent to 300 denarii. That's one denarius was equal to a day's wage. This is 300 denarii. This is a whole year's income. That's how much she pays for this stuff. And she pours it up. She doesn't just dab it behind his ears a little bit on the wrist. No. She pours it on him and wipes it off his feet with her hair. Sacrificially given. Mary's gift shows us what she thinks of the surpassing value of Jesus Christ. Mary realizes that it's worth to give it all to Jesus. But listen. This is the way we are. We North Americans, man, we're careful about what we're going to do. We make sure we spend most of it on ourselves, whether it's time, money, whatever it is. That's all. I worked hard for that money. I'm going to enjoy it. It's going to bring me pleasure. God gives us possessions. He gives us the ability to work. He gives us everything we have. 
And if we understand the value of Jesus Christ, we'll give to him extravagantly. We'll give to him in our worship. Well, well, I got five minutes. I'm going to worship God for five minutes. What are you, mental? Five minutes? Do you know what he's done for you? If this is the way we are. We're terrible people. I'm including myself in this. We, we need to give extravagantly to him because look what he's done for us. Look how extravagantly he gave to us. He gave his life. And we don't want to give to him. You know, when God gives you something, God gives you a car, and, 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 and somebody wants a ride, someone from the fellowship wants a ride, but you know that they wet their pants. I made that up. I couldn't think of nothing else. Because I just wet my pants now. No, um... Yeah, okay, stop that. Okay. So, this person smells. You don't want them in your new car. Think about that. And and, and don't look at me like, oh, I'd never do that. Oh, oh, yes, you would. Listen, why don't you ride in the trunk? It's so much nicer. <laughs> Forget about it. God gave you that car. So you have to clean the seat when you get home. Big deal. But it might be stains. So what? It's not your car. God gave it to you. It's his car. If you look at everything in your life as belonging to Christ because you couldn't have possibly got it without him. Oh, no, no, buddy. I work hard. I did that work. If God didn't give you four limbs, you probably couldn't have done that. If you had no eyes, could you have done the job you're doing? What if you what if you what if you were born without you know with half a brain? Could you have done the job you're doing? God gives you the ability to work. He gives you the breath to breathe. Everything we have comes from God. And we need to give it back to Him. We need to be able to offer it. If Bill comes to you and says, I need to borrow your car because my car is lousy, it's a Ford. <laughs> I say that because I drive a Ford, you know. <laughs> or tough. So, or that Chevy tough crap. Um, anyway, <laughs> God gives us a bill comes to you and says, I want to I want to borrow your car. You know what? Oh, uh, listen, I'll tell you something. About 25 years ago, I did this with Derek. So I, I told Derek, I said, we got to give everything to the Lord. You know, everything I have belongs to God. So I went out that, it was just that month, I bought a brand new vehicle for our family, the Windstar. And I just got it home, and Derek calls. He says, hey, man, can I borrow your truck? Holy crap, I just got it in the driveway. (laughs) (laughs) He was testing me. That bum. So I said, sure you can. So after my wife was done beating me up, no. Derek said, no, I'm just kidding. I don't want to see what you'd say. Good test. Good test. How much do we hold on to the things that we have? And yet they're gods. They're gods. And don't come and ask me for stuff now, okay? <laughs> you, know, you, know, you can borrow my children, but you know, anything else. <laughs> Everything we have, God gave to us, and He gives to us extravagantly. His grace, His mercy, everything. How dare we ever hold back anything from Him? You know what I'm saying? Y'all following me? Yeah, Mary gave her best. I can't even get to the second point, so we'll, we'll, we'll do that another year. But here's Mary giving everything she can, humbly. Judas is giving her a hard time because he's so selfish and greedy like most of us are. We do that too. Listen, I sat in church meetings where people are fighting about the carpeting. We shouldn't get it carpeted. It's going to cost too much money because they want to keep the money for the seniors group because we're all seniors. No, it's happened. I've seen this happen, man. And they start fighting about it. It's like, wait a second. It's nothing to do with us. This is to do with God. How's it going to bring glory to God? And you've got to be careful with this kind of stuff. Remember, everything you have, everything you are is because of Jesus Christ. You'll never hold back from him. Don't hold back from him. Y'all okay? Mm-hmm. I'm talking to myself too. 
Okay, so I'm going to go home and cry as well. So don't feel beat up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for everything that you've done for us. God, you gave us life and life abundantly. Father, you've given us salvation. You've saved us. You've rescued us from this life. You've rescued us from the wrath of God. We can have eternal life, peace with God forever, for eternity, because of you. There's nothing that we own. There's nothing that we have that is, has nothing to do with you. It all has to do with you. And so we're grateful. Lord, help us to be the kind of people that show our gratitude by the way that we take care of our possessions, the way that we lend things, the way that we are hospitable to everybody around us. Forgive us, Lord, for those times when we've been so selfish. This world teaches us to be selfish. And it's awful. It's awful. Forgive us, Lord, we pray. Oh, God, that we would be the people you've called us to be, caring, giving, just like Mary, humble. As we go about our week this week, help us to be extravagant in the way we give to you in worship, in praise, the way that we spend time with you. Oh, God, that we would stop looking at our schedule and start looking to you. Help us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Please stand. We're going to sing sing this beautiful hymn, Just As I Am.
come just as we are, Lord. We're justified through what you have done, Jesus, and what you have done alone. Thank you, God, that the work of salvation is, is just to believe in you, Lord, and to receive you, to trust you as our Savior. And so, God, I just pray for anyone here, Lord, who hasn't received you as their Savior yet, Lord God, that they would do so today, that they would put their trust in you today, Lord Jesus, and just ask you to forgive their sins and know, God, that you love them and that you forgive those who ask and you give us new life, Lord Jesus. We thank you and we praise you and we ask, God, that um, we would go with this challenging sermon in our, in our hearts, Lord Jesus, and that you would give us the strength to obey you every step of the way, Lord, and as you, you call us to give, Lord, by, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we would listen and obey and be filled with joy in serving you. And we just thank you and praise you. Everything belongs to you. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. We'll see you tonight at 6.